Welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. In this podcast, we discuss mystical works of literature and how they relate to recovery. We hope you enjoy today's podcast episode. Hey guys, Buddy C. Thanks for joining us for the Tao of Our Understanding, Understanding Lowercase for a Reason Recovery Podcast. Today we have Kate and Craig and Zach and Marla, good to have you guys today. I do want to mention a couple of online meetings that are going on. We have a meeting at 9 p.m. Eastern. That's every night. You can get there. I'll put a link in the in the notes, but it is zoomaameetings.com. Takes you directly to the Zoom link. That meeting is 9 p.m. Eastern every night. You have to log into a Zoom account for authentication, so a free Zoom account, and you can get right in. Then there's a 1 p.m. Eastern meeting, Monday through Friday, and the direct link for it is dailyrecoverymeeting.com. Dailyrecoverymeeting.com. Takes you directly to the Zoom link for that one. So that's 1 p.m. Eastern. Monday through Friday, and that's continuing for the time being, right, Marla? Yeah, uh, we seem, yeah, everybody is on board. Good, and this 9 p.m. Eastern meeting seven days a week has a, right now that we're studying Living Sober, and the night one is an AA meeting, the 1 p.m. one is a for any addiction meeting, right? It's not strictly alcohol, it's for any one in recovery in general, right? Correct. Good, yeah. good. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. You guys take advantage of those things. Today, we're talking about the useless tree. Would you read it for us, Kate? I know I didn't ask you beforehand. Yeah, I will. The useless tree. Yu Tzu said to Zhuang, I have a big tree, the kind they call a stink tree. The trunk is so distorted, so full of knots, No one can get a straight plank out of it. The branches are so crooked, you cannot cut them up in any way that makes sense. There it stands beside the road. No carpenter will even look at it. Such is your teaching, big and useless. Zhuangzi replied, Have you ever watched the wildcat crouching, watching his prey? This way it leaps and that way, high and low and at last lands in the trap? But have you seen the yak? Great as a thundercloud, he stands in his might. Big, sure, he can't catch mice. So for your big tree, no use? Then plant it in the wasteland, in emptiness. Walk idly around, rest under its shadow. No ax or bill prepares its end. No one will ever cut it down. Useless? You should worry. Yeah. Comments, thoughts. Hmm. Um, but what I got out of this about it's about that it's useful to be useless. And so so by not cutting down the tree, the tree was able to become something to to sit under and something that you know gave nourishment to the land it became useful in its uselessness and because nobody touched it or cut it down it continued to grow in its uselessness being useful in your useful uselessness (laughs) yes that's good marla being useful i won't use that for the title if you don't mind that's good One thing that I got out of that, leading on from that, um, so there's this big cat that has like a clear agenda and that, and it gets itself into trouble. And then there's this like solid yak with purposefulness, but he's staying solid. And then the tree is not trying to assert itself in the world and then it flourishes kind of like what you were saying so the cat is asserting itself and it gets in trouble the yak kind of stays still and doesn't 
and then it's it's okay and then the tree is not trying to assert itself in the world and it flourishes so i was thinking you know the guy that goes to zhuangzi um has a lot of expectations like his expectation is that the tree has to be um useful in order to be a good thing and it makes me think about like our expectations of what we think are meaningful and worthwhile and useful mm-hmm. need to be reevaluated you know like we have limitations in our thinking cuz just because we th- just because he thinks like that's what's good for the tree that's what's useful that doesn't mean that is actually right you know just because everything i conceive of like what i think in my mind is right doesn't mean that's actually the full potential of it so i kind of got the lesson that having like a single minded narrow view will will limit your experience in life kind of a warning against having like tunnel vision wow that's good what you got all that out of the useless tree <laughs> Let's go home. <laughs> we're done today. Yes, bye. <laughs> okay. We're done. We're done for the week. See you guys next week. <laughs> that's good, Kate. I think it's expectations and tunnel vision. And that's what I got. That's well, enough. <laughs> well, yeah, it's also about what do we value. I mean, people didn't cut down the tree because they thought it was really ugly. But to whose whose values was, who, what made it ugly? Who made it ugly? Well, who is it useless to? You know, I was thinking about labels, Zach. Like, we yeah. talk about labels a lot, you know? And then mm-hmm. we're coming out of the gate with a label. Before we even read it, we're saying, oh, this tree is useless. We're already out of the gate. We're saying that there's something wrong with this tree. Mm-hmm. From the title. Right. Right, right. Yeah. It's useless to the carpenters who it's useless to. Mm-hmm. And so I w- went on further, like what it means to be useless. So no one seems to know how useful it is to be useless. What is it to be useless? Mm-hmm. It's to be empty, free of striving to become something, to become anything special without goal or attainment. To be useless is to sim- is simply to relax, rest at ease, and allow our true nature to express itself in a simple, easy way. By being useless, the tree was able to live out its true nature. Did anybody else think about the giving tree at the same time? It's like yeah. about the giving the book, the giving tree. Yeah, you know, I've seen it. Kids. <laughs> I've read it a bunch of times. It's a weird book. I don't know how I feel about it. She just gives away everything. I know. I can't, I can't tell if that, if that tree was doing what it was supposed to or not, but I don't want to change the subject to a different book. No, no, I know. Uh, are the knots and twists in the tree from defects or are they from surrender? Is that surrender. A, surrender? Strength? Is it a strength or a weakness, or is it just is? That was my thoughts on that, Marla. Talking about the knots and the, and he said, and he's equating the 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 author's equating this to, to Chauncey's teaching that his teachings the same way, big and useless. His teachings are useless. Hmm. And I think about that. The only way I can equate that is when when we have this surrender discussion and people don't understand what surrender is, it reminds me of the same thing because um, sometimes, and this is what I've come across a good bit, is when we talk about powerlessness, let's say, um, people look at that and say, no, I'm not powerless. You know, like powerlessness would be one of these knots, you know, one of these twists that's useless. It's a useless thing, you know? 
And uh, it's useless if you don't understand its strength, for sure. Just as a tree like this, you don't understand its strength, sure, you would think it's useless. Any other comments? I mean, I think then it all. I think it all goes back to what Kate was saying about the. Uh, it's really just a matter of perspective, you know. Uselessness is how you're looking at it, you know. Or if you're the, if you're the carpenter, uh, it's it it you could see it as useless, but you know, if you're the tree, then uh, you know it's there's a lot of positive attributes to that crookedness. Um, if you're or in this case, I mean, like you're saying, it's the, 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 the teaching, you know, um, he, he's the, the guy is bringing to Sean, Chong Su is, he's bringing him this example of this tree saying, you know, this tree is like your teaching. It's big and useless. And, uh, his, his reply, reply is basically like, well, it's big, but useless is a matter of perspective, you know? Well, if you were not the carpenter, let's say you were a, a child and you saw the tree, what would you think? Would you think of the tree as being useless? Probably not. You could probably play under it, get some shade, you know, all those things. So it just, it's just a matter of perspective, like you were talking about, Zach. I remember I was out on one of my trips. I used to go four-wheeling in the desert with my son every year. We'd pick some part of the southwest and go explore. And we were, I forget where we were, but we were somewhere that's very dry and very hot, like maybe down around Big Bend or somewhere out in the middle of Arizona. And I saw this tree way off. I said, oh, there's a shade tree. We kept getting closer and closer. And when we got up to the tree, it was so dry that under the tree was cactus everywhere there was shade under the tree. You could not find a place to stand under the tree. It was packed with cactus under the tree. Every little inch of shade had cactus in it. I mean, I mean, I, I said, gosh, I could, uh, I said, someone years ago that was really needing shade that was out, I said, this would be a horrible tree to find. Because <laughs> you get there and it's totally useless to me, but it was very useful to the cactus, you know. It was just interesting. I'd never seen that before. And I was like, wow, that is really weird, you know. Uh, but it is a matter of perspective and a matter of what uh, what we're in need of. I think it's a control thing as well. We're trying to control what the tree's for and what the tree's doing. Was I think we're far from qualified. And the only thing that can decide how useful the tree is going to be is nature. And I think it comes down to the, the source or the, the, the creation of the tree. The tree is the tree's obviously there for a purpose. Nothing, nothing on earth is there without a purpose. I think if you, if you look at things from the tree's point of view and the man walks past, he'll say, there's, there's a useless man. All he wants to do is cut me down. All he wants to do is to trees give oxygen. Trees give homes for homes for wildlife. And there's there's probably a whole ecosystem going on within the roots of a of a tree. So I think it's really only as, it's only as useful as what what we're intending to to use it for. But I think because we I, I think Kate said it, we look at things in a tunnel vision. We only look at things for for how we can or what we can get out of things. It was only able to get so big because it appeared useless. That goes back to what Marla was talking about, too. Huh. No perceived value. I feel like the experience is so much broader that, like, the, the, a person would have in life if they're thinking about it. Like, if you're only thinking about the tree in terms of what it can do for you and the like it can be there as plant planks for wood or whatever if you can open it up to thinking about it and from all these other other perspectives life can be so much broader and better i was just thinking about how this related to recovery and just related to life in general you know if we 
make quick judgments. We have situations in life that look useless that, like you were talking about, Kate, many times have a lot of use if we will just be more open-minded, look from other perspectives, other uses, <coughs> rather than being single-minded and, you know, like you said, tunnel vision. That's good. When you first come into recovery, you think things are going to be linear. You think things are going to be fairly straightforward. And I think from a carpet's point of view, if, you, if you're looking for a tree, that's what you're looking for. You're looking for something that's straightforward and simple to use. But when you actually get into the, the, nuts, and, the nuts and bolts of recovery, it's as twisted and gnarly and nasty as, as it can, you know. It's, there is no linear in recovery. So if we're comparing a useless tree to recovery, it's, um, it's something that's a lot bigger than we, we think it is. It's not as straightforward as I think it is. And the knots, the knots can be all the obstacles that we come up against. How about we will not regret the past nor wish to shut the door on it. My wife looks at half the thing or most of what I do and thinks I waste my time. Because <laughs> she doesn't understand recovery, right? So she thinks it's big and useless. Now, she's respectful enough that she lets me do what I want to do but by the same token by the same token um, I understand that so I keep it within scope but you know a lot of things in our recovery especially things that would look like uh, um, past uh, problems in our recovery before you know before we uh, sobered up, could could be big assets that could be used to help others, but someone else could look at that and say, "Ah, oh, this this person's worthless. What 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 good are they going to be to society? Or what are you know?" Um, and we know that's not the case. So that's one thing I was thinking of with that. Very useful, Tina. Good to see you, ma'am. You too. You guys too. Hi. Um, yeah, pertaining to recovery, what I what I saw here was um, expectant acceptance and expectations. Um, you know, and it kind of goes along without judgment. You know, is it useful or not useful? That's a judgment or ugly. Mm -hmm. um, that's in its perspective. So that one too, accept acceptance, ex expectations, and perspective. Um, accepting the way it is exactly is and you know working around it making lemonade out of lemons um and the expectations are well nothing's going to look right or or be right if you expect it to do something you can't force it so if i expect this this animal to catch mice it's going to be useless if i expect this tree to produce straight planks of wood It'll be useless. Um, so all these expectations, the way we view things, and that's how we're going to look at them. And then, so we kind of set ourselves up, or at least I set myself up for failure that way. And um, at the end, when he says "useless," huh? Um, what do you say? You should worry. Yeah. Um, if that's his perspective, you know, when, like you just said, if he becomes useless, which really, I mean. That's perspective too, and judgment if he's worthless or worthless or not. But yeah, I thought it was really interesting. You know, it was, I mean, it's from just from both points of uh, of view. That was a good story. I like that. Plant the tree, so for your big tree, no use. Then plant it in the wasteland, in emptiness. Walk idly around, rest under its shadow. No axe or bill prepares its end. No one will ever cut it down. If there's a good, I like Marla's parallel too about the, the uselessness and the emptiness. I think that's good. What do you, I was thinking about, um, you know, back in, back in the day when I had my own feelings of uselessness because I couldn't, um, I was a dysfunctioning alcoholic let's lay it out. I could not hold a job down. That to me tied me to my useless, my usefulness or uselessness. It was hard for me to hold a job and I felt so useless. 
um, and then, but then I had a therapist tell me that um, I'm, I am the one in my family, because I related all to that, the one in my family who may be the one to see the light and to start the healing process for the next generation. Maybe I'm the one that's doing that. Um, and by seeking all of this knowledge, you know, this, the Tao and the recovery and everything, um, I'm working towards becoming enlightened. And that will make me useful. Does that make any sense at all? Sure. Yeah, of course, Marla. It takes yeah. lifetimes to become enlightened, but um, to work towards it in each life, as, a, this, as me as a soul person walking on this earth, it's my duty to become enlightened or woke. And that will make me useful. Yeah. Yeah, because if we're looking through the, the carpenter's lens, this tree is useless. Yeah. That's the whole point. We've got to change our perception of yes. how we're looking at this. What we value. Yes. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it reminded me of all the, you know, the Course in Miracle stuff about all these things we see are an illusion. The only thing that's real is love, you know, and all this other stuff, you know, is, is a, a type of illusion that we put up and we gauge through these other um, filters and glasses and all of this. Um, and it causes us to, to make decisions based on fear and uh, which judgment and all these other things are part of that. But yeah, it's the same, same kind of thing. We, we've got to, change our perception we have to look at this from other viewpoints of other mm -hmm. you know we all there's usefulness there that we can't see a lot of times especially if we're the carpenter you that's know? really that's very true there's useless usefulness we don't see yeah because of our own tunnel vision see isn't this a good chapter it is verse? Not, it has a ton in it <laughs> Well, what's the phrase of our past would be our greatest asset? Isn't that a, who knows that? I don't know. That's a quote. I know it's. I don't know, but it's a good one. It's an AA one, I think, isn't it? Tina, do you know that one? Well, the one I have is, but we must be careful not to drift into worry, remorse, or morbid reflection, for that would diminish our usefulness to others. After making our review, we ask God's forgiveness and require, and inquire what corrective measures should be taken. Um, I just read that page a lot about um, on awakening the next day, let us think about the 24 hours ahead, you know, and how our unique situations can help others in terms of, you know, you hear the quote, um, this mountain has been assigned to you to show others that it can be climbed yeah. and everyone goes through whatever they go through or if they're misshapen like the tree or for whatever way they look, it might be ugly to others, but to someone else, it's going to be the perfect shade for cacti to grow, or it's going to be, you know, the exact story someone else needs to hear as it, you know, when somebody is taking it as is. But Zach, I like what you said about the, um, the giving tree. Um, I agree. There are some children's books that I've read when I was a preschool teacher, and I thought, hmm, this seems a little, a little weird, you know, or is it giving the right message? Um, yeah, it's, it's weird. Like, I, I mean, I never could decide if I was like, I couldn't decide if I was on the tree side or not, you know what I mean? Like, are they holding this tree up as like, this is the way you should be, or this is not the way to be? I think it makes sense when you're younger to show, I don't know, I'm with you. But I saw a virgin recent, recently that said um, the tree finally went to um, um, realize how codependent it was and put up its boundaries and stuff. Given how yeah. it stopped a little boy, I was like, whoa. Well. I, I think we've pretty much covered the useless tree. Y'all want to talk about the giving tree for a minute? I'm not <laughs> familiar with that story. We should talk about all of the trees, yeah. I, I don't remember it completely. I just know that this tree, grew, this little boy grew up with this tree that loved him. And he kept, as he grew, he kept asking things of it. And she kept giving him everything until there was nothing left of her. 
And right. That's that's it. There's like, what's the moral of this story? <laughs> what does it mean? And as a kid, under like trying to understand that, like, do I what? Why would that be a children's story? I don't remember. It's not even understandable as an adult story. Is it a good thing to, to give yourself a lot and then to be charitable and then have nothing left? I don't know. No. So no, it's, it's a book called The Giving Tree by Shel Silverstein. And um, the book follows the lives of an apple tree. The lives of an apple tree and a boy who develop a relationship with one another. The tree is very giving, and the boy evolves into a taking teenager, man, then elderly man. Despite the fact that the boy ages in the story, the tree addresses the boy as boy his entire life. In his childhood, the boy enjoys playing with the tree, climbing her trunk, swinging from her branches, carving me and tea into the bark, and eating her apples. However, as the boy grows older, he spends less time with the tree and tends to visit her only when he wants material items at various stages of his life or not coming to the tree alone, such as bringing a lady friend to the tree and carving me and YL, her initials, often assumed to be an acronym for young love, into the tree. In an effort to make the boy happy at each of these stages, the tree gives him parts of herself which he can transform into material items, such as money, from her apples, a house from her branches, and a boat from her trunk. With every stage of giving, the tree was happy. And it would say, and the tree was happy. Next page. And then the transaction and the tree was happy. In the final stages, um, in the final pages or stages, both the tree and the boy feel the sting of their respective giving and taking nature. When only a stump remains for the tree, including the carving, me, and tea. She is not happy, at least at that moment, the boy does return as a tired elderly man to meet the tree once more. She tells him she is sad because she cannot provide him shade, apples, or any materials like in the past. He ignores this because his teeth are too weak for apples and he is too old to swing on branches and too tired to climb her trunk and states that all he wants is a quiet place to sit and rest, which the tree, who is weak, being just a stump, could provide. With this final stage of giving, the tree was happy. So... Giving no matter what? I mean, I guess it is just your epitome of unconditional love. You know, I, I look at it more as a mother. I, I could see myself doing that for my children if yes. I were the tree. I mean, at all costs, go live your life, go have fun, come back. Whatever I have is yours. And even at the end, if all you need is, it makes me want to cry thinking about it from a mother's perspective. Um, but should you be? Yeah, no. I, but you know, I mean, that's the question. I don't know. Right. Well, I think I know that's how my mom is. You know, everything I put her through with my addiction, with my drinking, with all my stuff, no matter what, I can count on her. I can go back to her. And I don't think I take her for granted. I just think, but you know what? Maybe sometimes I do. But I know she'll always be there for me, just like I'll always be there for my kids. You know, I, I told my son the other day, he was... He slipped and said a bad word, and he was so upset, and he couldn't contain himself. And he said, Dad's so mad at me. He doesn't like me. Dad's so mad at me. And I, I told him, I said, honey, you, you could murder somebody, and your dad would still love you. And that is the truth. And he was said, no, that, that's not. I said, absolutely, it's true. Absolutely, it's true. And it made him feel better. But, you know, just to think someone loves me that much that I could do something horrible and you would still love me is is huge I, I think especially for little ones hmm. Hmm. Kate explain the giving tree to us you're the fount of wisdom today I don't like the giving tree <laughs> I think it's a weird book that's all I'm gonna say about it <laughs> yeah, that's good <laughs> I'm with Kate. I don't know. I'm going to have to digest that a little bit. Thinking about that, the other, about Mother Teresa and about some of the people who just live to give, you know, and it's the same as the giving tree. Is that what our ultimate goal is or not? You know, is that taking it too far? Is that being, but you know, useless to yourself. What if you thought about the giving tree the same? We see a stump, but we're, saying that stump is useless just like maybe 
the carpenter is seeing the useless tree. Maybe it's the same story. Maybe. It seems like the useless tree arrived at its uselessness while it was still a tree. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? Whereas the giving tree uh, arrived at the same conclusion when it was a stump. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> so is this, is this giving tree? I just, I can't, I know this is not the subject of the story, but I mean, I just can't get over like, is it, is the giving tree? Is it like, is it self-actualized and the picture of unconditional love or is it, you know, uh, is it extremely codependent and doesn't know how to draw a boundary anywhere? Okay, well, why don't you, we could look at it this way. It, it's exactly where it is. You know how we, we do not wish to shut the door on our past. Well, the tree's past is all of the things it has done its whole life with the giving, giving, giving. Um, so it is where it is, and you can't change the past. So is it, do we sit and judge it by its past? Do we judge its usefulness right now? Right. as a stump because we can't live in all the stuff it did in the past um i see both sides definitely um but i think we just have to say we had just have to talk about the now so is the stump useful yeah, yeah. the guy gets to sit on it yes okay and is the stump happy and the stump is happy the stump is happy the stump yeah. is useful and yes and yes there's lots of love there but maybe it's also a reminder how other people may not want to live their life. You know, I see that tree and I'm like, man, I don't want to be giving all my apples and wood away. But, but I think like you hit the nail on the head, Tina. The stump is happy. The stump's not sad. The stump is happy. I feel yeah. like the stump is only happy because it's being useful. If the right. if it had ended with the stump having no use for the boy or and the boy with, uh, slash old man and the old man boy was like, I still like you, even though you have no use to me whatsoever. That would have been a little better than him being like, oh, I still like you because you still have a use for me because I can sit on you. Yeah, exactly. Right. It's yeah. weird. <laughs> <laughs> because I know in recovery, I have felt like the stump. Um, I wrote a, a weird little story one time. I found this brass unicorn and I'm like, man, these things are so great because it, the, the corns never break off. You know, I crystal unicorns, ceramic unicorns, the corns always broke off at the Goodwill because they're all thrown in the basket. Well, anyways, I just, I'm like, I feel like a unicorn with the, with the corn broke off. Like I'm useless because I just have this ugly stump now on my head where a corn used to be. And you know, it just made me realize like those things are pretty too, but I felt like the stump at the end of my drinking. Like I've, I've messed everything up. I have nothing to offer. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just how I felt, but people saw more than that. And, and that's how I view other people. I've, I, when people say, I just, you know, I should be further along. I should have this. I spent half my life in recovery. I've spent half my life messing stuff up and it's like no you're you were assigned this mountain to show others it can be kind you're exactly perfect the way you are even if you just have a stump for a corn on your head yeah but but you're not happy with that and the stump is happy yeah that's, See, the, that's goal. the difference right that's right the, difference. the stump is happy but like kate said it's happy because the guy's able to sit on it so like it's not like the stump never gets to the point where it's content in its uselessness or, you know what I mean? Like it, like it's only ever happy when somebody's using it. Does it say in the story, are you assuming it's not happy when it's not being used or yeah. does it, the story actually say, the tree that, was sad. The tree was sad when the boy was gone. Okay. The tree was sad when the boy was gone. So it does say that. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> hmm. It is like a mother. The tree is like a mother in the giving tree. It's Look at that shit and grin on Craig's face. He's waiting. He's got something. Watch him. He's ready. <laughs> Go ahead, Craig. Lay it on us. <laughs> right. So I've never read The Forgiven Tree. 
So I can't comment on that. What I have done is a bit of research. Now, I, I know I should do this before we meet. So I'm actually reading The Chong Su by Gai Fu Feng, who we use for the translations in the Tao. And the, the verse that we're actually reading isn't, um, this, this is from the Thomas Merton book, which, uh, like I said last week, there's, uh, Chong Su is actually only accredited to write in seven parts of the Chong Su. The useless tree actually comes from the end of um, a book called Happy Wanderings. And it talks about another tree. So I'll just, I'll just read that for you. Um, Hao Tzu says to Chong Su, the king of Wei gave me some seeds from a huge gourd. I planted them and they bore a fruit big enough to hold five bushels. I used it to carry water, but it was too heavy to lift. So I cut it in half to make ladles, but they were too shallow to hold anything. They were big, unwieldy and useless. So I smashed them to pieces. Chong Su says, my friend, you're not very intelligent in your use of large things. There was a man from Sung who could make a good salve for chapped hands. His family had had a silk bleaching business for generations. A traveler heard of this and offered to buy the secret formula for 100 pieces of gold. The family gathered together to have a conference and says, we have been bleaching silk for generations and have earned only a few pieces of gold. Now in one day, we can sell the secret for 100 pieces of gold. Let him have it. The traveller took it and offered it to the king of Wu. Wu and Ye were at war. The king of Wu entrusted the traveller with the command of his fleet. In the winter, the fleet fought a naval battle against Yu and totally defeated it. The traveller was rewarded with a fife and a title. In both cases, the cure for chapped hands was the same, but was used differently. One man got a title while the others were still bleaching silk. Now you had a big gorge, big enough to hold five bushels. Why didn't you think of making it into a great barrel and using it to float along the rivers and lakes instead of worrying about its being useless for holding anything? Your mind, my friend, is still very cluttered with trivia. And then it goes on to the story about the, the, the useless tree. So I think it's I think it really does come down to what we actually want to use it for and the perceptions. And I've, I've just figured out the difference between the chapped hands. So the sailors in the in the winter time actually used the salve to cure the chapped hands so that they could they could use it for something completely different to what it was actually meant for. Just thought I'd share that. Comes down to perception, doesn't it? Down to perception. I just killed the conversation. That's okay, Craig. Um, anything else with that, guys? I think we covered the useless tree pretty well. Thank you, Kate and Marla. Y'all had some really good stuff, and this Kate blew me away today. Yes. Who knew? Blossoming. Now, I we want to awesome. hear what you have to say next week on a hat salesman and a capable ruler, because I get that makes no sense to me at all. So, um, Are you ready for that one, Kate? Have you been studying the, the – have you been meditating on it? Oh, she's shaking her head. Good. What's, what's next? The hat, A hat salesman and a capable ruler. Is that what we're, we're doing next week? Yeah, that would be the next one in line. Okay. Did you write that down somewhere and I didn't get it? It's in the, uh, I gave you the Merton PDF, right? That I have, yeah. Or, or, the next one, next page. Oh, just the next one, okay. Yeah, next one after. And I'm going to go ahead and read the, the Breath of Nature in case we get into that, if, we, if the hat salesman goes by really quick. But, there uh, may be a reason that he starts out with the, uh, the useless tree. There's probably right. a reason that that's the first one, because some of these you read them, and I'm just like, well, that was useless. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a, there's a lot more here. We just have to we sit and meditate and think about it and talk about it, you know. So that's good. That's yeah, good. Thank you guys for all being here. I'm enjoying it. I'm glad we're continuing, you know. I have had the most trouble spiritually with the pandemic in the last week to two weeks, and I've had the entire time. With spirituality? Well, just the fact of the whole thing, the ongoing of it. 
has you know, been it's been wearing on me you know and i'm doing better now i had to do a little four step on it and had to you know work through it but we're under a great deal of stress yeah you know whether yeah. we're home or not there's a great deal of stress that we're all experiencing differently yeah, yeah. Um, buddy, you said the everyone. ongoing of it buddy yeah. you said the ongoing of it you mean that it's the continuance of it yeah you know that it's just not over you know you know that's uh that's been i've i've gotten some peace about it the last few days but i had to do a little four step last week on this and do some and i picked out several people in the pandemic that were handling it different ways that were some that thought it was nothing in a conspiracy and some that thought it was you know taking it to extremes and everything in, in the middle and i picked out several different people and started praying for them on an almost daily basis and had them on my prayer list and and just kept for each of those and within a few days that anger that was under the surface just started subsiding because i had said why am i angry it wasn't for the reasons i was thinking you know and that uh that really helped me with that uh craig you have something yeah i'm just i'm just starting to notice my fears starting to creep up now that it's ending um and it is ending for me on saturday because I'm, I'm back to work on Saturday. Um, I think it's because I don't want to go back to my old normal. And I know we've, we've had this conversation before. I've spent the last two years just just surrendering to things. Any time we do anything, I, I, I kind of look at Michael Singer and think to myself, do you know what, the, the, guy's, the guy's built his life on just surrendering and just not resisting anything that's going on. The one big thing that I do want to resist is going back to the old way of, of how things were. I don't want to be spending my, my, my seven days just constantly, constantly doing things and not achieving. Whereas I think in the past, it must be about 10 or 11 weeks, I've achieved so much from just doing nothing. And I don't mean doing nothing as in sitting idle. I've had the opportunity to spend so much time with my family. It's been phenomenal. And I think that's maybe where some of the fear is creeping up as well as the fact that I know that that time's coming to an end. I'm not going to be here the 24-7 that I have been. And the last time I felt like this was when Callum was born. And I, I took a couple of weeks off when he was born just to help Louise out around the house and obviously just to spend some time with him as well. And then when I went to work after he was born, I kind of had that fear that I was going to miss something out at, at the house because my attention has been taken away to an external source and I really don't want to be given into that, that the external influences that, that I gave into all that time ago because he's nine now and it goes by so fast I mean Zach will know this as well having the, having the kids cutting about as well just the, they grow up so quickly you, you blink I mean Callum comes through the room in the morning and he's got this big mop of hair because he refuses to get it cut and I'm like who are you? Or you'll come down from his room and you, you've not seen him all day because he's been he's, he's been playing with the PlayStation. He's talking to his friends online. And you're like, no, I've not seen you all day, and I really don't want to go back to missing out on as much as I think I have. I mean, maybe maybe I'm just being paranoid and I haven't missed out as much as I think. But just I think as a dad, we don't have as we don't have that connection that mums have to their kids. And I, I think as a dad, just going out to work again and losing eight hours of my day to work rather than eight hours that I could, I could be spending with my family. Spending with, I know going out to work, I'm going to be providing for the ones that, that I need to provide for, but mm -hmm. it's just, um, I, I don't want to be losing that connection to my family, to the external, the external influences. So that's, that's where my fear is, is creeping up. And I, we, we spoke about this in a meeting yesterday, um, and I don't think it is just so much the resentment that I'm having to go back and not everybody is. I think that's really the underlying factor is that I don't lose the connections that I've, that I've built. Hmm. Well, that's more awareness. That's good. Yeah, it's awareness. And you'll work hard to con maintain those connections mm -hmm. because you have to work, don't you? Unless you're independently wealthy. In my mind, I'm independently wealthy. In my bank account, I'm not. See, it depends on how you make it. I actually shared, um, there's, there's a couple of guys that I know that aren't in recovery and they know that I'm, I'm in recovery. So every, every time I, I speak to the guy very, 
very irregular. And he always says to me, so how are you doing with the not drinking? So I, I sent up my snapshot of um, my, 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 my sobriety tracker and it tells you how much money you've saved. So he had a look at that and he's like, wow, don't you feel so rich having all that money? And I was like, well, do you know what? I don't look at wealth that way now. I look at wealth as to what I have spiritually rather than just what's, what's there. I mean, don't get the, 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 the That's money's a big, gone. That's tree, Craig. Yeah, I mean, the, the, the money's the money's gone. My, my wife's seen to the fact that the money's gone. Um, but it's, uh, it just really does depend on how you look at wealth as well and yeah. your riches. And I, I think we spoke about this in the meeting earlier on today as well. It's, it's how you measure it's how you measure your wealth. I'm, I'm wealthy in the fact that I have people that I love, people that I, I have that I can spend time with. Um, and that's one of the that's one of the wealths that I don't want to do without. I can give up. I can give up finance. I, I can give up. I can I can surrender so much, but there's just that one thing that I would struggle to do, and that's I think that's where I'm struggling at the moment is just to separate my time from from the people that I love. Well, you know, you could. You got plenty of people going back to work that you can pray for, that you could you can uh, spend time sending love and kindness to them to help with your fear. So you, you have plenty of folks to, to, to use, you know, you don't have to look far to find someone to pray for. That's what I'm saying. So that's good. Let us know how you come along with that. Oh, I'll let you know. I'll be on the phone to you. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone else guys? No. I'm Everyone home. good. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll, uh, we'll see you guys next week. Hello, this is Buddy C. I wanted to make you aware of several recovery-related resources that I've posted in the episode description. These resources include a list of recovery podcasts, a free sober meditation app, daily recovery email, shared Google recovery calendars. Hope you put some of these resources to use and have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it with your friends in recovery. 